right, everyone, I'm going to get started because I've got a lot to say and I've only got 45 minutes. So um, thank you for coming to my session, which is called Why Estimations Go Wrong and How to Avoid It. Um, I know that's a very kind of lofty uh, goal to have at the end of the session, but hopefully at least I can give you some pointers and some tips to help um, improve things, if nothing else. My name is Pamela Barone. I'm a client service manager uh, at Previous Next, which is an Australia sort of remote-based um, Drupal services company. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about our team later on, but um, I've been doing Drupal for uh, like five and a half years now, I think. Um, been at Previous Next for almost five years, so I've had a long time to um, make mistakes and learn from them. So the kind of hypothesis or um, uh, I guess my, my thinking around this is that it's not the estimate that is the problem normally, it's the scope. So, I mean, in, es estimating is simply uh, trying to guess how long something is going to take, which uh, it should be pretty easy as long as you know what the thing is uh, that you're trying to guess. So, if that's true, why do we screw it up so often? And, I mean, I, I think the thing I've found is that it's almost never because we... Uh, totally guessed wrong and something took way longer than we originally thought, although that does happen. Um, most of the time, it's because what, whatever we estimated was not actually what we were supposed to be delivering. So um, the best way to get better at estimating is by getting better at defining what you're estimating. So that's the sort of um, the point I'll try to get across here. So I'm going to start with a real-life example of where this went horribly wrong. Um, this probably looks like a really straightforward request. We'd like to add ReadSpeaker to our site. Uh, can we get an estimate for that? And if you've never heard of ReadSpeaker, it's a text-to-voice plugin that reads out web pages. Uh, they bought a license, and they wanted us to add it to their site. Sounds pretty simple, right? Um, but this is how we interpreted it. And if you can already spot the problem, then well done. But um, we said, oh, okay, we need to add the ReadSpeaker module. There's a module for that. Install the module, turn it on. What could go wrong? Um, but obviously, that's not what happened. So um, the actual ticket that we had that sort of tracked this request was called add ReadSpeaker module. So the developer estimated adding the ReadSpeaker module. Um, you know, came, came up with a massive total of 5.25 hours, which is so precise, but so wrong. And um, in the end, we spent over 60 hours implementing this request, and nobody was happy about it. Why did it take so long? Um, well, a lot of reasons. But, I mean, it, it, I could talk a, a lot about sort of in this specific example what went wrong, but the module provided a block. Uh, they wanted it to be under the header, not in the header, and we were using panels and in-place editors, so we had to write this crazy update hook that moved the block into the right spot on every single page. And anyway, that was like one of the things that kind of took this request totally off the rails. Um, and then also, there were actually two sites that we had to do this on, and I highly doubt that that was factored in. Um, so what did we do wrong here? Well, first of all, it doesn't seem that we asked any questions whatsoever. Um, we want the ReadSpeaker module. We want ReadSpeaker, we'll add the ReadSpeaker module. That's what we did. Um, we'd never done ReadSpeaker before, so we had no idea of what things could possibly go wrong. Um, and based on that, we should have probably assumed it wasn't going to be just a simple case of adding the module. And also, uh, we didn't specify to the client that what we were estimating was adding the module. We said, we, we didn't clarify at all. We took their request and we said, that's going to be five hours. So they said in their heads, okay, the thing we want is going to take five hours. And then um, the, the last mistake we made was throughout this process of eight months, there was very little pushback on them to say, um, hang on a minute, I understand that you want to keep doing more and more work on this, but that's definitely not what we originally discussed, and we're kind of feeling like this is going a little bit above and beyond. And I think once you start heading down that path, it can be really hard to catch much later. You have to kind of nip it in the bud straight away and say, hang on a minute, um, I understand that this wasn't clear, but what we were actually estimating was just adding the module. Anything that we need to do further than that, we're going to have to discuss that. Um, so just a little bit about my team. Uh, we're a small company of about um, 15 to 20 people, mostly devs. And um, I have to mention that we are a top five core contributor by company, which is um, we're pretty proud of just because we're, um, we're small. So compared to a lot of the big shops, we, um, we, we probably punch above our weight. Um, we're Drupal specialists as well. So we do a lot of integrations with other systems, but we don't develop in other systems. 
And um, we take an agile approach. So we don't really have a sales team. We have a few client service managers. Um, we do sort of all of the selling, new business, um, definition, basically all of the client management stuff. We do big and small projects, so they can vary in size from 20 grand to 500 grand. And um, we have a lot of long-term clients, which means we have a lot of ongoing work that requires a lot of estimating. So just to talk through some of the things we estimate and why, um, this example is probably the one everyone's familiar with. You get a tender, you have to guess how much it's going to cost to build the site. Um, in this case, you kind of have a to find a balance between estimating too much and losing the project and um, estimating too low and then being on the hook to deliver something that you can't. So um, these are usually high-level estimates. We try to do like relative size, so you know, 32, 16, 8, that whole thing. Um, this is often the hardest to nail down because you don't usually have a lot of detail and uh, you have to come up with something, but you know, you don't want to spend six months working on a tender, you don't want to bother the client too much, but you kind of have to just take a stab in the dark, really. Uh, the next one is um, once you've won the project, you have to actually estimate the broken down features. Um, this, in this case, the project's been approved, and you just need to basically figure out how much you can get done in a single sprint, so you break it down to stories and you estimate those. We try to do relative size for those, but um, you, know, you have a lot more information there. It's a lot more specific. Um, but the other thing to note here is it's usually not critical to be accurate to the hour on each ticket because if you have 100 tickets in a sprint, some will go over, some will go under. We don't really labor over this too much. Um, and this is the thing we do the most. It's the most tedious, it's the most frustrating, and it's sometimes the most agonizing. But um, it's usually something really specific. And this will come from a client that we're, we've been working with for a long time. We've you know, probably done a big project for them. We've got a number of littler projects. Sometimes they're not that little, sometimes they are. Um, that come up kind of all the time. You know, a client will send me an email and say, hey, we um, want to start running ads on our site. How long is that going to take? Uh, it can be anything from you know, a half day's work or a couple of months of a mini project. But um, I mean, I think the key thing here is that there's no feature that's too small to be properly defined because, as we saw with the read speaker example, um, the little ones can be the biggest problems. And again, as I said, this is actually the bulk of estimating that we do. This is definitely what I spend the most most of my time on. So um, this is kind of what I came up with as guiding principles of how this should all work. And um, this all should happen before you even start to talk about numbers or cost or estimating at all. So the first thing that I um, sort of strongly believe is I need to understand what the client is expecting us to deliver and how we're going to deliver it. The second thing is I need to be confident that what I think the client ex is expecting is actually what they're expecting. And the third thing is I need to ensure that the developers have enough information to implement the feature successfully. So I think these are really useful to kind of come back to before you send it over to a developer or a team to look at. Just think, have I, have I met these three principles? And I mean, obviously, the degree to which you can confidently say you have it, it might change and you might not be super worried about it because it's a client that you've worked with and you trust and you're not, um, you're not really stressed. But it's really good to kind of think back and go, wait a minute, before I go any further here, have I, have I met these guiding principles? Um, and this is just a really kind of, it's just a, uh, description of how we do this. So um, we spend a lot of time estimating, and uh, as I said, um, you know, I do this a lot. Like pretty much every day, I'll get some kind of request. So um, I try to make it as painless as possible for everyone. Um, it can be really challenging to spend the time that's necessary to do this because you're busy doing work that's being paid for. So no one wants to drop that and deal with estimates. I mean, I'm sure that you've all had this experience where you ask me to estimate and you get an eye roll. I mean, I roll my eyes often when I get those requests too, so I can't really, I can't really talk. Um, but anyway, what happens is the request will come in, the project manager who works with that client will assess it, um, ask the questions that are really obvious, send it back to the client, get some information back, send it on to a dev, dev hopefully asks a couple of questions, um, sends an estimate back, and then we add some buffer, you know, for testing, and we do peer review, and we have automated tests, so we always add a little bit of extra time for that, and for um, communications and that kind of thing, and then we send the estimate on to the client. But um, just one thing to note as well, um, I probably can't say this is entirely true, but we try to make sure that all of our estimates are vetted by devs, so we don't have a situation where someone went off and said, oh yeah, I've heard of a module for that, that'll be fine, and then the dev team guessed it and was like, what the hell, there's no way we can do this. So we try to avoid that at all costs. 
Um, and this is a quote that I'm sure we've all actually said. If we haven't said it ourselves, we've heard it. Um, not just in my company, I think in software world in general, this is something you hear a lot. But the thing is, um, what's more likely, right, that every developer in the world is terrible at estimating, or there's some other point of failure in the system? And I think that um, it's really important to kind of think about where you're going wrong. And I mean, the read speaker example is a good example because the developer didn't necessarily give a bad estimate, but he was estimating the wrong thing. I mean, but he was specifically told, add the read speaker module. So he went, okay, that's easy. That's not going to take me more than a couple of hours. Um, but of course, um, the problem that we planned to solve was not the problem that the client needed us to solve. So um, I think it's really important to engage your developers in this kind of discovery definition process and ask them questions, challenge them, say, you, okay, you said four hours. If I ever get an estimate that's just a number, I'm like, wait a minute. Tell me what, you're, what are you actually planning to do here? Because I need to know what it is before I can go and tell the client that this is actually a reasonable estimate. Um, and I mean, I think obviously it's important to note that some developers are better at estimating than others, I think. Some are probably better at understanding their limitations and what could go wrong and the kind of common problems. But um, the ones who consistently estimate poorly are the ones who never ask any questions. So I think that, um, again, this should be ideally not a one-sided process of kind of um, me trying to extract the information that I need. I, I don't want to be constantly being the one to, to challenge. I love the developers who come back to me and say, I don't think you thought this through. There's you know, these three things that I've already thought of that could go wrong. You should find out what they want to do here. Um, I don't think this is the best way to do it. I love getting that back. I mean, in an ideal world, I wouldn't have to because I would have done it perfectly, but I know that I don't always. So um, I, I, when, I, when I have an interaction back and forth and I'm getting a challenge, I feel much more confident that we're actually uh, doing the right thing by our clients. So, I mean, yeah. Sure. <laughs> The question was whether we engage with a single developer or go to the team. Um, it depends if it's a if it's a project that's like a sprint that's actively happening. We do team estimates, but if it's something where you know it's a retainer or it's a mini project, I'll just pick the developer who I think knows most about it, and then also will probably be the developer who implements it, because that's another thing that I'll um, mention later. But um, yeah, I mean it just depends on the situation. But because we're a small team, uh, we don't really have sort of hard and fast rules. It's just kind of like I need to get this done. What's the fastest? most efficient way to do it, and then I'll sort of figure it out on the spot, usually. Um, but I mean, I think the, the thing here, again, is that th there's open communication, and I'm not, um, you know, I'm not going to get mad at them for asking questions, and I'm not going to uh, yell at them for not just doing it, and I mean, I really rely on them to help me and make sure that I haven't missed anything. And I mean, I think that um, the fact that I try to respect their time by making sure I'm not passing them a totally insane request that makes no sense. I think that um, they kind of um, reciprocate that by trying to help me out and not making me look like an idiot. So um, that's useful. And then also, um, I kind of alluded to this before, but it's good to create some just general guidelines. Like I said, this is not hard and fast. Um, we don't have specific rules, but these are just some things that we've come up with, which, um, you know, by, by figuring out the pain points that we've had, we've kind of tried to come up with some sort of guidelines. So um, the first one is whoever does the estimate leaves notes, as many notes, like it gives as, as much of a detailed synopsis as possible what they're planning to do. And that's for two reasons. The first reason being they might not be the developer who, who implements it, but the other thing is sometimes it's like four or five months before the thing gets approved, and then you go back to it and you're like, what the hell are we talking about? How the hell are we planning to do this? You know, it, it happens to us all the time. So this is just kind of a, you know, make sure you've written notes about it. Um, and the other thing that I often find happens is if someone estimates something as eight hours or ten hours, it turns into 16 really quickly because they go, oh, well, I forgot about um, this thing that I will have to do. You know, I forgot about this. So anything more than four hours, just break it down and say, these are the things that make up the eight hours. And you'll often find that it's maybe actually 10 or it might be 12, and um, that's a much better way to get uh, an accurate estimate. And then anything long, larger than 16 hours, this is probably the thing we adhere <laughs> to least, but Anything larger than 16 hours should be sort of standing checked by another developer because we often have where one developer will say, 
oh, that's 100. And then it'll go, we'll go, no, that's 20. And then it's like, oh, well, that guy knew a way to do it that the first guy didn't. And they can talk about it and say, oh, okay, actually, I see now how you could do that in 20 hours. Um, so these are just, uh, oh, yeah, and the review, this is one that I always have to try to remind myself. The review time is proportional to the amount of custom code. So if you're estimating a feature that's just adding a module or just updating some configuration, adding a content type, you probably don't need massive peer review. But if the, if the task requires developing a huge custom module, there's probably going to be about five rounds of review and arguing over the best way to do it in core. And, and just, um, just make sure you factor that in. So these are just some examples of things I've kind of come up with along the way as I've noticed um, patterns of things going wrong repeatedly. Uh, and so when in doubt, um, allow your developers to spend some time up front to do some spikes or whatever it is. So um, I gave this talk in, at a camp in Sydney, and uh, one of my developers was in the audience, and he asked me at the end, or he, he kind of raised his hand at the end, and he said, well, you know, estimation's hard, and you don't always know the answer. And I was like, yeah, I know, that's totally fine. So if you, I mean, if you didn't already feel comfortable just coming back to me and saying, I've never done this before, um, maybe you should ask someone else, or I've never done this before, can I spend a couple of hours on it and make sure that the approach that I'd like to take will work? I say, absolutely, do it now, that's not a problem. And I mean, you, you will find that you're maybe spending time um, digging into estimates that then don't get approved, but it will more than pay for itself by kind of avoiding that read speaker situation where, you know, we spent 60, we got paid for five, um, we could have done a lot of spikes in that time to have avoided that problem. So, I mean, you know, whenever it's, a, if it's a new module, if it's a new feature, if it's something that no one's ever done before, just spend some time on it, ask around in the team. Probably someone else has done it before or has um, made some mistakes and kind of learned things that will decrease the time it's gonna take the second time. Um, and the other thing I'll say is I have one developer who always asks me for a design and it absolutely drives me crazy, but he's right like nine out of 10 times that we should do, a, n not necessarily a fully you know, pixel perfect design, but we should do some kind of mock-up to say this is what this page is generally going to look like and then the client can see it and say, yes, that seems right or no, just rearrange these things because um, it's a lot easier to do that in the design process than after you've implemented it. So. Um, Encourage your developers to feel totally comfortable suggesting any of this, and if they ask you for it, then let them do it. And then just if there are any developers in the audience, I would just urge you to try to take charge and try to push some of these changes through. So, you know, if you're, if you're a developer in an organization where you're constantly being held to unreasonable estimates or um, being made to estimate without enough information, just push back and try to, you know, enlighten the people above you. And I would say that if you work in a place where you aren't empowered to do this and you're, and you're going to say, well, my boss doesn't care, it's like, well, you should probably get a different job. We're hiring, so talk to me after. <laughs> um, so, yeah, if, if, you don't have, um, if you don't have enough info, don't estimate. Uh, so this is the next sort of piece of the puzzle is the impossible clients who are always changing their minds and adding to the scope. So I've heard this so many times, I've said it myself, um, but I think the thing to really remember here is clients aren't doing this on purpose most of the time. I mean, we have some clients that you're like, really? But um, most of the time they're not trying to do the wrong thing. They're not trying to withhold information from you. Um, they just really don't know what to ask for. So. Um, I mean, most of my clients are not tech savvy. They're not, they don't have digital backgrounds. Um, when they ask for something, sometimes it makes sense. Sometimes I have no idea what they're talking about. But, um, you know, the thing is, they don't necessarily know how to phrase it in such a way that they're going to get back exactly what they want. So it's really on me to interpret what that is and not just do the thing they say to do. So um, I always try to reframe the request. You know, sometimes some clients will send me really specific requests, like, we need a new fieldable panel pane type that will do X. And I say, wait a minute, what are you actually trying to solve? Like, what's the problem that you're trying to solve? Don't talk to me about fieldable panel panes. Step back, what's the problem? Let's talk about the best way to solve it. And I mean, this is not a knock on my clients, but it's, the best way to solve it is almost never the way they thought it should be solved. But that's because they don't spend their whole lives in Drupal building websites, so I don't expect them to know the best way to do it. In fact, if they could tell me the best way to do it, then probably I should get a different job. Um, so like I said, I often get requests that are really specific, and they might not make sense to me, so I just try to step back and say, you know, what, what's going on internally? What, pro what process is this for? What process is it part of? And then we can come up with a much better way to solve it. So um, 
you know, if we just estimate the thing that they've asked for, we've done something, but we haven't really done our jobs, which is to play that role of interpreter and um, deliver the best value. So, I mean, I've mentioned this already, but definitely ask questions. I mean, I can't even think of a thing that we've ever done where we didn't have to ask any questions to get some better idea of what, uh, what we had to do. So, um, you know, ask things like, how did you envision this working? How will you use it? Who will use it? How often will you use it? Um, why do you even need this? Are you sure you need it? Is there something else we've, we already have built that might actually solve this problem? Um, and a, a, a quick note to the client, if you get an estimate back without having been asked any questions, you should be very wary because it's unlikely that you're going to get what you want. Um, and then the other thing I've sort of found is that you should be really specific. And this is something that I kind of picked up from my partner who uh, has a painting business. And whenever he does a quote, he specifies exactly what's included. So prep, two coats of paint, clean up, or, you know, sanding, whatever. And the reason that he does this is because sometimes he'll give that quote to the client, and the client will say, I actually think it needs three coats. And he can say, okay, sure, I'll add that to the quote. But then you're not in a situation where he goes in and does the work, does two coats, and then they're saying, well, I, I think it needs three coats. And you're arguing about what you had said you were going to do because it wasn't actually totally clear what you were going to do. So um, provide specific detail of what you're planning to do. And again, in the read speaker example, that would have helped because it might have triggered, it might have, I don't know if it would have, but it might have triggered a conversation with the client to say, well, adding the module, that sounds really easy. Why do I have to pay you $2,000 for that? Um, which is a valid question. And it gives them an opportunity, as I said, to, to spot things that might be missing. So, um, oh, I, I can see you you've put these five things in, but we also thought we would get this. And then you say, okay, sure, we can, we can add that and we can estimate that. Um, and then also it gives you something to reference um, if you need to push back on scope later. Um, and the, the, again, with, as I said with the developers, it's really important to just be honest. Um, sometimes we really don't know how long something's going to take. And it's totally fine to say this. If, if you don't have that kind of relationship with your client where you can admit that um, it's something you're not familiar with, that's probably a sign of some of the problems. So um, if, if we're unsure, it's, on, it's up to them to decide. Um, maybe they'll approve a small amount of time to do some investigation, or maybe they'll say, you know what, it's not that important, don't worry about it. Um, one other thing that I think is really important is I think a lot of processes try to paint all clients with the same brush. And I know for a fact that every single one of my clients works completely differently, whether it's you know just their personality or the um, environment they work in who their boss is, all those kinds of things. Um, you need to use your previous experience with clients to assess what type of client they are and what type of estimate they're after. So um, we have some clients who don't mind iterating. They'll, they're will they happy to pay for the MVP and then keep building on it as they go. But then I have other clients who it's a huge pain in the ass to get budget approved, so they'd rather have me double it, um, try to do it in little, as little time as possible, and then they can use that extra time on something else that they want. But the thing is, they they'd much rather go over than go under. So, so I just know that and I factor that into the estimate that I deliver. And if it's a new client, of course, you should assume the worst. Yeah. Uh, do you have like, any specific way like, how to profile a client? Like, some people, like, they have this, you know, like, they have like, 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 No. No, so the question is, do I have a process for how to do it? No, it's just a, do you just get to know them? I mean, again, I think that's basically what my job is, is to make sure that I'm doing the right thing for them. And I think if you have a client service manager that can't do that just in their head, maybe you should give them a different job. <laughs> I don't know. Um, so th the thing with this is that um, it's not just about covering your ass and saying, we had it on paper, so you can't sue us now. That's really, really not the point. But the point is that... Um, Having it down and having it established before you start is, makes everything so much easier and smoother and more efficient. So, um, as I said earlier, it's much easier to make a change to a design to move something and change the layout than it is to change that post implementation. So um, you're much less you're much less likely to have surprises and have that kind of awkward, "Oh, this isn't how I thought it was going to work" conversation because you've already established how everyone thinks it's going to work. So um, this just makes everyone happier because. You know, even if you do have enough time in the estimate to make the five changes that came up because you didn't do a design, that's just not really fun. I mean, no one really wants to work in that kind of environment. So um, 
I mean, like I said, this really isn't about um, forcing someone to sign a piece of paper that says they agreed to a certain scope. It's about trying to establish the scope to get the best result. Well, I mean, yeah, yeah. Well, the question was about how to balance um, feedback on designs versus feedback about feedback on software. And I mean, I think that's obviously um, we're not doing pixel perfect full page designs for every single feature. It's really just about like it could even be just drawing on a piece of paper to say um, this is the order that the filters are going to go in, or this is where this field is going to sit. I mean, we had a a pretty small task recently that totally exploded because the client wanted to search, we established all the fields that they wanted searched, and then when we built the page, they were like, oh, well, this should be here, and this should be here, and I don't think this should happen at all. And there were all these um, things that if we had just drawn a picture, we could have delivered it so much faster. And again, the developer had the shits because, you know, he's like, well, no one told me that's what you needed, and the PM was getting shitty with the developer, and the developer's not happy either, so, like, it's just a totally losing proposition. But, I mean, I think we... we we don't do full page pixel perfect designs really ever anyway. We do design components. So um, we don't really have that problem. But I'll, I'll, maybe I'll talk a little bit more about that later. I still have a lot to get on with. Um, so just lastly, in terms of process, you do need a really good team of people to um, kind of execute this properly. And we have an awesome team, so they make it really easy for me. Um, I think the key thing with us is that we all feel like we're in it together. So. Um, I feel responsible for making their jobs easier, they feel responsible for making my job easier, and um, kind of ensuring that we're all working toward the, um, the ideal outcome. Not everyone fits this model. Um, we've had developers in the past who didn't fit this model, and it didn't work out. So I think um, it didn't really work out for either side, because the, the person in that position didn't want to have that obligation to the rest of the team, and we felt like they weren't contributing um, equally because they weren't providing that, um, that interaction. So um, for me, I think, um, and I think with a lot of us in my company, this is a lot about self-preservation and not necessarily um, because we all feel an overwhelming desire to make the business succeed, even though we do. But the thing is, as I said, it just makes your job a lot easier if you have clarity and you have confidence and you have that understanding among your team. It makes your day-to-day -day life better, which is... Um, much bigger of a concern for me than, you know, the profit share or whatever that, you know, the, the kind of money side of it. But the profit share is nice to have. Again, talk to me after if you <laughs> want a job. Um, so just going back to the read speaker example, there are a few ways we could have done it better. Um, the, th these are basically two different approaches we could have taken. So the first approach would have been to explain that we were only estimating for adding the module, because we didn't really know what was going to happen after that. Um, it might work. There might be more stuff that we need to do. Um, this would have been really cheap. Five hours is really not a lot of time. And um, it would give them a chance to kind of see what they're getting and then take it from there. Um, but the second thing we could have done is just spend some time up front working with them to establish what the details were, including that they wanted the button to sit under the page title, which was the sort of critical piece that we missed. Um, this, this would have taken some time on our part, but we probably should have just even installed the module on the um, pull request site and shown it to them for free, and then we could have charged them for, um, you know, the time we spent and the additional work after the pack, once we'd known what it was. Um, so, like I said, with the client profiling, the, the, which option you choose, and you might have a totally different approach, just depends on what type of client they are, and um, again, if it's a new client, then make sure you done the second one, don't do the first one. <laughs> so looking at a more successful approach that we took to a kind of open-ended feature, this is an actual request that I got. Um, we'd like to add a blog to our site. Someone told me Drupal has a plugin for that. And when I get these requests, I, this is like a definite eye roll triggering request. But actually, this is a really good opportunity because the way I interpreted this was they know they want to blog, but they don't really know much more than that. Their expectations are really nonspecific. Um, and this is a great opportunity to collaborate with them and work incrementally to deliver something really well suited to what they needed. So what happened next was I explained that this blog plugin was in fact a module that enabled a content type. 
So we turned the module on on the dev site, um, explained how the content type worked, showed them exactly what a blog in Drupal gives you out of the box, and um, this gave us a foundation to basically start the conversation from, okay, this is what you get for free. Now what extra do we need to add to make this blog viable for you to make it um, achieve your goals? And we came up with a list of requirements, um, you know, like tagging and landing pages and topic pages and all this kind of stuff. And we estimated each feature separately, gave it back to them. They decided that some of the features they asked for, like subscription and, you know, notifications, oh, we don't really need that yet. Let's see if people are actually reading this thing first and go ahead with the basics. So we didn't end up arguing at all about what was included, what wasn't included. There were absolutely no surprises. Um, it probably took a little bit longer because there was a lot of back and forth. Um, um, but on the other hand, this gave, gave them the opportunity to showcase it with their stakeholders and show people. And that way, again, none of the stakeholders were shocked by this thing that they had paid a bunch of money for because they knew exactly what it was going to be. So um, in this case, the client was really happy. And the team was also really happy because they knew what they had to deliver and they were able to deliver it well. Yeah. So the question was, if we if we spent two hours installing a module, would that be done as a paid consultation? In this example, they had uh, a monthly retainer, and that's actually something we try to set up with all of our clients is, um, you know, just a couple of hours a month to do minor things like that. And I would say, um, if we didn't have a retainer, I probably would have done it for free because I knew they wanted a blog, and I knew that it wasn't going to be like a fishing exercise of, you know, it wasn't a competitive tender, so it wasn't like they were going to go get five quotes. And, I knew they were probably going to go ahead with it, so I would have spent the time anyway, set up, spent the two hours or whatever it would have taken to set it up, talk to them, and then that would have been, you know, we would have been able to recoup that cost in the actual implementation. So it, it, something like two hours would never bother me about doing it for free. Um, and then the last thing I'll say is that you um, should just know when to say no. So some estimates just can't be done. So this is another request we got for a new page for events where we can add lots of different content and lots of different layouts. We don't really know what it is yet, but it has to be totally flexible. Um, so Chuckles suggests that you've all been there before. So the way I interpreted this was basically the polar opposite of the previous request, right? It's really vague still, but they seem to know exactly what they're expecting, whereas I have no idea how to deliver what they're expecting. So um, this is a huge red flag for me, right? Expectations are clear, but details are not there. So what ended up happening with this was we communicated back and forth a lot, and I really tried so hard to try to get the information because I knew they really wanted it. But um, I just in the end said, look, I can't estimate this for you. Come back to me when you've um, got some more details. You'll need to know the details anyway um, if we're going to implement it. So I'm really, I'm not going to give you this open-ended estimate that could totally blow up in our faces. Um, they were not really happy about it because, you know, they just wanted us to do it. But I think um, that kind of relationship where you're getting and taking orders from your clients and then just giving back something kind of rubber stamped is a really bad working relationship. And you should try to reshape that into something a lot more collaborative anyway. So um, we didn't get this work, but... Totally not a problem. Nobody is unhappy about this because I could see the train wreck coming from a mile away. Um, so just to wrap things up, um, this is cheesy, but it <laughs> kind of speaks to what I said earlier, which um, is that I really don't think that there is a you know, black and white process or a set of rules or a spreadsheet that you can make that's going to make this process perfect. I think it's really about... Um, Following your instincts, employing people who have good instincts, um, employing teams that can work together really well, and um, just to kind of summarize, I mean, the key thing, again, is just to understand what you're estimating. So make sure everyone understands it, make sure the client understands it, make sure the client service manager understands it, and make sure the devs understand it. Um, and if you're, if you're finding that you're having a lot of problems with your estimates, do an honest assessment of your process, and don't just blame it on your developers, because it might not be their fault. Just, just a possibility that it might not be their fault. Um, so, you know, really try to engage your team, make them feel empowered, and um, collaborate with your clients. There's nothing scary about it. Um, you know, like I said, I, I do roll my eyes sometimes, but um, it's obviously a really necessary part of the job that we do, and I wish we didn't have to do it, but we do. So, um, yeah, just be, be open and be honest, and, um, and that's it. So, any more questions?
Um, well, I mean, we, we use agile processes, but, you know, we sort of loosely use Scrum. We don't really subscribe to a single agile philosophy because, as I said, I think having a one-size-fits-all process for all of your clients, um, it doesn't work for me, for sure. It might work for some people, but I find it much easier to just tailor the process to whatever works for the client. So we are agile in the sense that um, basically we don't do fixed price quotes when we are quoting something, we're estimating hours, and then we burn down from those hours. So that's, that's really what I meant. Um, I don't know if you had more. Yeah. I think, um, so the question was about just how you estimate and whether it's one developer. I, I agree that it's better to have a team, but we couldn't feasibly get a team to estimate everything that we're doing because that would take the entire week would be estimating. If every developer had to be involved in every estimate, it just wouldn't work. So there are definitely times where we have to go to a single person. But I mean, again, I think um, I trust that if I give it to a person who doesn't know that much about it or feels like they aren't confident, they'll go ping someone and say, hey, how does this sound? Or they'll say to me, um, I'm not sure, you should probably run this by someone else. So I, I feel like, again, it's not a case of like, everybody drop everything, we need three people to argue over an estimate, because I think oftentimes that um, isn't really productive. It's just more about like sanity checks and making sure that it's not totally crazy. Because like I said, you know, it doesn't have to be down to the hour accurate, it just has to be accurate enough to get you over the line. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, we do a, so the, the comment was just that there's kind of a re-estimation process after you do the big estimation among the team because, yeah, when we do a tender, we obviously don't get our whole team to estimate it. We get a single dev and our um, tech director to make sure it's not wildly inaccurate. But because, we're, because we work in an agile way, when we do an estimate uh, for a project, like I said, we don't, we don't really care if the content migration was estimated at 100 hours and it takes 120 because we're banking on that 20 hours being made up somewhere else where we overestimated. So that's, you know, kind of a confidence that we have that it's not going to go, um, it's not going to go too wrong. <laughs> Any more questions? Yeah. Yeah. But I don't mind that. I mean, I think uh, I often, so the question was about overestimating. And um, the reason I don't mind it is that we don't charge a fixed price. So I don't feel bad if we estimated 50 and it took 25 because the client can either not pay for those extra 25 hours or they can use them for something else. So there's really no, I mean, you know, you want to be accurate because you don't want to put them off of a feature because you've scared them off because you thought it was going to take twice as long as it did. But I don't really see a huge downside in overestimating. Um, and I, I often find that developers will say, oh, you know, is it okay if I say 16? And I'm like, make it 24. You know, like, it doesn't, it doesn't really matter because we're only charging for the time we spend, so it's not like we're, you know, it's not like we're scamming or we're um, trying, to, trying to steal from people. We're just trying to make sure, you know, I'd much rather be 10 hours over than four hours under, you know. Yeah. Well, I think I have to say I was not actively involved until it hit about 50 hours because I sort of saw it happening and then I jumped in and was like, hey, out everybody, stop what you're doing. This can't go any further. So we should have stopped at five, um, but we didn't. So definitely that's what should have happened. And I mean, that's another point to make is, if we estimate eight and then after four, we know, oh my God, it's actually gonna take 40. Just stop at four, go back to the client and say, we were completely wrong about this. I understand that's really frustrating, but let us know if you wanna proceed. And if you don't, that's totally fine. We will eat those four hours. So um, that's another kind of example of where you need your team to be putting their hand up and going, crap. 
um, I was way wrong, I'm really sorry, what do you want to do? And it's not a case of like, oh, how could you do that? It's a case of like, oh, okay, thank you so much for telling me before it got out of hand. Now let's just deal with it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we would never have committed to, like, you can have all of your wildest dreams for five hours. We, when we give an estimate, we're, we're going to say, we will spend up to five hours on this. So, like, if, if they were going to come back and say, that's not what you promised, then, like I said, kind of before, that's really a relationship issue. And we hopefully don't have any clients who would have that expectation it, that it's not going to become a fight because um, we, we've been really upfront about the fact that all along we were going to spend five, see where we were at that point, and then adjust from there. And I mean, if it's going to, if we said five and it's going to take seven, it's not a huge deal. We might just choose to, to wear that cost. It's really a case-by-case -case basis. So in this case, the minute you have to go away, Sorry? No, but just potentially. I mean, it's it's a case case by case thing. Like there are some times where, um, you know, the review went a little bit over, and we spent two extra hours. And I'll, you know, if it's a client we've worked with forever, um, I'm not going to quibble over that amount of money. It's just not worth rocking the boat. But um, you know, if it's happening ten or twenty times a month, then obviously that can add up. So um, I think if it's if it's not happening a lot, then I wouldn't worry about it. Did you? Sure. <laughs> Well, we, I think, so the question was if you get to five and you haven't because the, you haven't gotten to what they wanted because the scope was, or the deliverables hadn't been firmly established. I mean, I think that, um, like, in that example, we definitely could have known that we could have installed the modules in five hours. So that's why I say that um, we should have said that's what we're doing is installing the modules, and that way there's no... So you, you can't be completely open-ended about it unless you have a client that's, you know, totally agile and totally on board. You do have to establish some kinds of, you know... Um, yeah, boundaries, exactly. So, uh, Murray's waving at me. I think we're out of time. Okay. Thanks, everyone.